521. Everybody stand, sing out good and loud. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. today. Just y'all wonder why I'm up here and the pastor ain't. The pastor is sick. And uh, so y'all keep him in your prayers. Uh, he's tore up big time. <laughs> he, he don't like not being in God's house. But uh, for the best, uh, best situation right now, the way he feels and the temperature he's running and what's going on uh, with the infection and all, he's best to stay at home today. So uh, I think they had to chain him to the door, chain the door put padlocks on the door and just keep him at home. But uh, <laughs> anyway, he was talked into it. And so he, uh, he's at home, not feeling well. So y'all definitely be praying for our pastor and that uh, God just touch him, heal him, and uh, he'll be back with us as quick as possible. All uh, right, any other prayer requests this morning? i take a few prayer requests. Anybody got one? Okay, remember that. I know we all got lost loved ones. Yes. And I know we all got unspoken requests this morning. Gary, uh, remember uh, Buster and Ruby, uh, Ruby especially, because she's, she's just really sick, you know, all the time. And um, uh, and remember my nephew, Kenneth, he had, Sammy's nephew, he has uh, he had cancer, and they took it out of his lung, but just remember him. Okay, remember this. Buster and Ruby and Kenneth. Any others? I want y'all pray for a young man by the name of Josh Hill. He's not my Josh. My Josh passed away soon be five years ago. But this is the young man, Josh Hill. I don't know him personally, but uh, he was involved in an accident a year or so back. Became a quadriplegic. Uh, was in like one of these rolling wheelchairs where you roll with your hands. 
He went on like a 13 mile ride in it and wore blisters on his elbows doing that. He got infected, turned into Mercer's. Uh, as of yesterday, he was unresponsive in ICU. Uh, he's got, I know he's got one young son. And uh, I put some on about Josh Hill and somebody was like, is that not your son? <laughs> no, my son passed away, I'm sorry. But, but uh, pray for this Josh Hill. I don't know him personally, but uh, uh, tragic situation there with the Mercer's and all. Any other prayer requests? All right, Buzz Earl, would you open us in prayer this morning? Father in heaven, it's good to be back in your house this morning. It's good to be able to come back to your house. God, I know there's many people traveling this weekend, and God, thank you for being merciful to them and being safe. We pray for these this morning. He's calling out a special uh, pastor. Pray God that you be with him today. I pray you bless him in a special way. And I pray God you heal him. Able to come back and do more work for you, God. And I pray for this Josh Healy, God. We know it all about him. And God, I know that without you, he may not make it. I know without you, he won't make it. But God, I pray for you and this young, this young man to make him heal again, God. And I pray now, God, that you'd be in each one that's being in the service today, with your brother Jerry, that leads the choir. And, and I pray, God, that you Amen. Brother James will be doing the preaching today for us, so thank God. We're, we are so blessed in our church to have a minister of the quality of Brother James. Uh, he's done a whole lot of fill-in during that period of time when we were looking for a pastor. And tremendous man of God, uh, has been preaching all his life, pastored for quite a few years. And thank God he sent him our way, and we have him here. And so we appreciate Brother James a whole lot. Keep in mind now, uh, Bush Hill Factual. Next Saturday, Wednesday night, we'll be passing out the schedules as far as the workers, when to be there, and where they'll be, what they'll be doing, and that type of thing. And then homecoming, the 23rd of this month is homecoming. And so you ladies go ahead and start figuring out the banana pudding and the fudge brownies and the, all the desserts. I don't worry about the other part. Make sure you got plenty of desserts. But anyway, homecoming the 23rd. Get the word out, invite your friends, family, your neighbors, old members, potential new members, whoever. But uh, let's fill the church up. Brother Jimmy Clark will be here in the girls' home for the girls to definitely pray for them. Pastor, I just pray for them. Okay. So they'll be here with Sarah on that day. They'll be singing and ministering there. So uh, keep those in mind. And pray for the choir now as we sing for you. And uh, listen, listen really to the words of the song.
Get your hymn book, turn to page 520. <coughs> Stand, sing out good and loud. Brenda's going to sing a structure for us this morning.
So long I had searched for life's meaning Enslaved by the world and my greed Then the door of my prison was opened by love For the ransom was paid, I was free Is your hymn book, turn to page 515. <clears throat> page 515, we'll sing the first verse. Then after the first verse, the next two verses where our brother Dennis plays, I want you to shake hands, fellowship, tell your neighbors and all around you that you love them, you appreciate them, and uh, glad to be in God's house with them today. And then we'll go back and sing the last verse. Everybody stand, sing out. Since I've been redeemed.
and we're not having children's church today, and I'll turn it over to Brother James. All right, good morning. Glad you're here. Uh, wish that the pastor could be here, but we are glad to be able to help him. We need to pray for your pastor every day, amen? Let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 27, if you would please. We're going to look at a few passages of Scripture in the Gospels. Uh, I would like to speak to you for just a few moments this morning on the crown of thorns that Jesus uh, wore. The four Gospels gives, all four Gospels give an account of this uh, Scripture that we're fixing to uh, read, the story that's therein. Uh, and out of the pages of the Bible, we see Pilate jeering out. Is this thing echoing? Uh, jeering out at us. And sometimes I've read this account many times, and you sort of feel um, a little bit uh, uh, sorrowful for Pilate because he was put in a predicament that he did not want to be in. He was put in a predicament that he did not choose and would have rather not been a part of that. But let's begin reading in Matthew chapter uh, 27, beginning in verse 27, if we may. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had planted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away uh, to be crucified. Uh, I want to uh, read also in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, you don't necessarily have to read uh, or turn there, but I'm going to read just a few verses. Is that thing still kicking back? Uh, but in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, uh, if you read all of this, verses uh, 6 down through verse 15, uh, but I, I want just to read a few verses, if I may, uh, beginning in verse 6. He says, Now at the feast he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired, and there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude crying aloud began to desire him, that is, the murderer, Barabbas, to do, or to uh, uh, Pilate, rather, to do as he had uh, ever done unto them, releasing the man. But Pilate answered and said unto them, uh, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews. Uh, so he's, then if you skip down to about verse uh, 12, Pilate answered and said unto them, What will ye that I should do unto him uh, whom ye call the king of the Jews? Uh, and then uh, there, I want to read the gospel of John's uh, account of this, if I may, in chapter 18, uh, beginning in about verse 33. Uh, there's a lot of reading if you read it and compare, and compare these Gospels. But there are several things that we we're going to bring out of this as we go through it. Uh, John's Gospel, chapter 18, verse 33. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou... Uh, uh, sayest thou... Uh, this thing of thyself, or did others tell it to thee of me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? My, uh, he says, My own nation, the, uh, or thine own nation, and the chief priest have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would, I have, uh, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from thence. Pilate answered, or Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. 
To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my word. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And it's sort of interesting as you uh, sort of uh, think about this. Pilate, when he asked that question, he didn't take uh, time to give Jesus any uh, time to response. He just turned away, uh, you know, and, you know, said and went on out. And he says, told the Jews, I'll find no fault with this man. So let's take just a minute to pray and we'll continue. Father, thank you for this time. We pray for our pastor. Pray that, Lord, you'll touch him physically uh, and spiritually, meet every need. You said, Lord, uh, that you would, where you guide, you provide. We pr trust that you'll do so for him and bless his family. We pray for the few minutes that we have here, the message, Lord. Uh, we've not had a lot of time to prepare, but, Lord, you know what we need. Uh, we just commit that to you. Pray that you'll bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, when you come back to Matthew chapter... Uh, uh, ver, uh, chapter 27, the question of all questions that Pilate asked in these passages of Scripture is, what shall I do then with Jesus, uh, who is called Christ? Uh, what a decision that this man had to make. I mean, it was a decision he did not want to make. It was a decision that he was forced to make. Uh, it was a decision that changed his whole um, his whole destiny, I mean his eternity and all. He had to judge the judge of all the earth. Think about that. He had to choose between Christ and the crowd. And we know that if you read all four Gospels, he chose the crowd over Christ. Uh, he had to receive or reject the truth. He asked the question of the Lord Jesus, what is truth? Uh, but did not wait for an answer, he just turned and walked away goes back out and tells the people, uh, I find no fault with him. There is, a, uh, there is an irony in all of this uh, when you think about prophecy and when you think about what took place on that day. Uh, it is something that everybody faces, you know, in their life. Every one of us is going to face, you know, the thing with what we do with Jesus. Every one of us is going to face what we do with truth. Uh, all of us are going to either choose between Christ and whatever. Uh, we're going to either reject uh, him or we receive the truth about him. But Pilate offered the people Jesus or Barabbas. This is an irony. If you go back into the Old Testament, there is a mystery uh, I like to think of it of as uh, in the Old Testament when the, on the Day of Atonement, uh, when uh, the priest, the high priest would come out uh, he would go in, of course, and do whatever he'd done inside, offering up the blood. Uh, he would come out. He had two goats. Uh, there is, you know, the scapegoat that we sometimes refer to. He had two goats with him, one on either side. And uh, he came out, and he would bring these two goats. They had to be identical. Uh, he brought these out to present to the people. And there's sort of an irony there that, uh, you know, one of them was chose by lots to uh, be set free uh, as the scapegoat, as they would lay their hands upon them and pray, picturing our sins being carried away, uh, as Jesus would do. Uh, and the other was offered up as a sacrifice. But the, the irony of all of that Old Testament uh, picture there, it is that, and on this day, Jesus was presented with another man. Two men was presented that day. Uh, one of them, of course, would be set free, Barabbas, uh, and the other one would be offered up as a sacrifice for sin. Uh, he, he offered, of course, the people the choice between Jesus and Barabbas. And as you read the Scriptures, he longed, he wanted, the Scripture says that he was willing that he set free Jesus. That's what he wanted to do. Uh, but, of course, we know that did not happen. Uh, so, in a sense, just as he took our place uh, on the cross and suffered for us, he took Barabbas' place, uh, he took Pilate's place. Uh, all of that took place on that day. 
And of course, then there was the whipping, and there was the mocking, and the crown of thorns. But as you go through this, there's three things that uh, sort of caught my eye uh, some years ago. And I want to share it with you as we think about what happened to Jesus on that day and what's, uh, you know, the, the idea of the thorns, the crown of thorns that Jesus wore. Three things. Number one, in verse 29, they put a crown upon Jesus, but they did not make him their king. In verse 29 uh, of Matthew chapter 27, And when they had planted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. They put a crown on Jesus' head, but they did not make him their king. Uh, as, they, as a matter of fact, they dressed him as king. They put a scarlet robe upon him. They gave him a reed, which was a type of uh, a scepter. Uh, all of this typified royalty. And yet, uh, you know, they, they stripped him of that when they were finished mocking him, indicating, of course, that they uh, did not receive him, would not receive him, make, them, uh, make him their king. Uh, they put the crown of thorns on him, but they did not make him their king. The, there's another thing that's uh, uh, sort of that fits into all of this when you go back. Jesus in the Bible, he's in every book of the Bible. Beginning in the book of Genesis, he is the seed of the woman. And we, we're not going to go all the way through that. But as the seed of the woman, there was the promise that he would come. Uh, and he would bruise uh, or he would, uh, uh, you know, mash the serpent's head, which signified uh, that he's going to defeat uh, Satan. And then there's going to be the bruising of his heel. The thorns were a result of the curse. If you go back to Genesis uh, chapter 3, it talks about the curse came and there was thorns and thistles. This is the fruit of the curse. This is the result of the curse that was passed upon man, uh, creation, everything because of man's sin. Uh, but it's interesting that Christ, who is the second Adam, is now bearing those thorns, and by doing so, he is going to uh, remove the curse. That is part of the work of the cross. That is what he did on the cross uh, for us. You know, but these people crowned Jesus, but they didn't make him king. And that, you know, that sometimes happens in our lives. There's a lot of people that talk about Jesus as king. Uh, They, you know, we uh, sometimes will testify the fact we sing about him being king, and yet we sort of just don't make him king of our life. He seems to be king at church, but he's not always king at home. Uh, He seems to be king, uh, you know, before others around about us, but he doesn't seem to be, or he's not king at work. And so we just sort of pretend, or we sort of go through the motions of him being king. But let me ask you a question. Is Jesus really really king of your life? Does he sit upon the throne of your heart? A lot of times in my mind, and it helps me, I envision the Lord Jesus sitting on the throne in me, in my heart, in my life as king. It helps me and it keeps me consciously aware that he is my king. I am his subject. Uh, Do I do all things right? No. Am I always right? No. Uh, Brother Gary said it this morning, we don't have much of a burden for lost people like we need. You know why? One of the reasons is he's not king of our lives. But is he really, truly king of your lives? Does he rule and reign in your life? Uh, Jesus said on one occasion, he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not those things that I say? Uh, And we're all guilty of that. I mean, we just don't allow him to be king. We talk about it, and we sometimes uh, put a crown, as it were, on his head, but we just don't make him our king. The crown of thorns, not only uh, was a, a, it was a gesture, a gesture of him being king, they were mocking him, of course, but the crown of thorns hurt Jesus. I mean, think about it. Uh, these thorns were not just uh, briars. I mean, these were long, uh, long thorns. I've seen them. Uh, pictures of them that uh, grow in the uh, Holy Lands there in Israel. 
uh, and how they made that thing up and then just crammed it down over his head. They hurt Jesus. But when we, like the Jews that day and everybody was there that had a part in the crucifixion, when we just crown him by words only, it really hurts the Lord. We grieve him. Uh, we are to abide in him. I venture to say, if, you were to, if I were to ask you the question, what does it mean to abide in Jesus, could you actually give a good explanation of that? And sometimes I have asked people questions like that just to see how they would respond. But uh, abiding in him, allowing him to abide in you, that's making him king. We do that by faith. Just as we are saved by faith, just as we receive him uh, for the forgiveness of our sins by faith, we abide in him by faith. It's the same thing. I mean, we're just believing that he is uh, in us and we in him. But it grieves him. It hurts him when we just in word uh, say that he is king, but we don't really make him king. We not only hurt Jesus, we hurt ourselves. Uh, a great deal of time when we're just not what we ought to be. There's a second thing here that uh, I notice. They praised Jesus, but they didn't mean it. Uh, look again in verse 29. It says uh, that uh, when they had planted these thorns, they put, him upon it, they put them upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they uh, bowed the knee before him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They praised Jesus, but they did not really mean it. Uh, Hail, King of the Jews. These are words of praise, of course. These, these are words that you would actually say if you really meant it uh, to the Lord Jesus. But they are words of praise. But they, they didn't mean anything when these people said it. Uh, sometimes we, uh, down through the years, uh, over the years, I've known a lot of people. Uh, we come up in a church that uh, did a lot of shouting. Uh, running the aisles, you know. I've seen people jump out windows uh, and, uh, and all kind of stuff. But I'm not so sure that Jesus was in all of that. I remember one time we was at, uh, uh, at uh, Friendly Chapel uh, in Mount Airy, Don Collins. We were, he was pastor there. And I understand somebody was telling me that he is in the hospital up there dying with bone cancer. I did not know that. Uh, Brother Don, we've known him for... 40 years, longer than that, 50 years, close to it. But we were up there one day, and I've shared this with some of our people. A fellow by the name of Red Kirby, I don't know if you know him. He was a tobacco farmer. Uh, he was a pastor of a church. He owned a church. He built it, paid for it, he owned it, and he ran it. Uh, he didn't let anybody have anything to do with much with it. But uh, he was a very interesting fellow, but he would run and do all these things. Well, one day we was up there uh, at uh, Friendly Chapel, and uh, Mays Jackson was preaching. Mays was just a shouting and preaching. You know how Mays, he's very, uh, I love Mays, and uh, he was uh, just preaching away, and all of a sudden, old Red Kirby in the back of the church, he jumps up, runs around the church, and throws up the window and starts out of it. But then he came back in. He was two stories off of the ground. Brother Mays told him if the Lord had been in that, he'd have went on out the window. <laughs> I, I guarantee you. So a lot of people praise the Lord, but I, you know I, they just don't mean anything to it uh, or about it. They were just mocking words here. Uh, we say a lot of things about Jesus. I heard uh, Dr. David Jeremiah uh, in one of his sermons uh, here uh, here a while back. He read some words of D.L. Moody. In these words, and I have, I've got to paraphrase them because I, I didn't write them down, but I, he was saying that D.L. Moody, these words he said was something that was spoken a hundred years ago. But he says it's just like they were spoken today. In this, D.L. Moody says that Jesus Christ, somebody had asked him something about Jesus, and he says Jesus was the best friend he ever had. He was a better friend than his wife. He was a better friend than his family. He says all the things that he's done for me. He saved me, forgave me of all of my sins. Uh, and he goes on and talks about being able to preach the gospel and takes it around the world. And God using him, he says, and in the end, he says, Jesus is the best friend I've ever had. He's the best friend you've ever had. He's the best friend I've ever had. 
Even when bad things happen, he's still the best friend you and I have. Uh, and sometimes we, but we don't treat him like that. Sometimes we praise him, uh, just sort of flip it. Uh, a lot of people do things just off of the cuff, not really thinking about what they're doing or to whom uh, they're doing it before. You ever live your life in his presence. Uh, this is something that has helped me over the years. No matter where I go, if I'm on the job, if I'm at home, no matter what I'm doing, I've always in my mind tried to keep consciously aware that I'm living. I'm walking around about in his presence. That will help you to stay uh, faithful. It will help you to ever be mindful of him. But to praise him and not mean it, uh, you wonder what it really means and does to the heart of God. You know, God is very personal. He loves you as an individual. He loves you and me like we are. That in itself ought to cause us to praise Him from the heart. Uh, he loves us in spite of what we are, what we do, what we don't do. We can be unfaithful, but the Bible says He is faithful. And so praising Him and not meaning it, uh, it really says a lot about our Christianity. Christianity in the West is pathetic. I'm just going to be honest with you. The churches in this country... Uh, the, the things that it takes to move people. Uh, Brother Gary was talking about churches being entertained, uh, and that's what a lot of it is. Uh, but uh, not, they just don't really have a concept of who Jesus Christ is. He's God, uh, and he's our, uh, he's our Savior, and it's, he's also the one in whom we're going to have to uh, you know, stand before one day. But, uh, you know, we say a lot of things about Jesus that we just don't mean. I'm guilty of this, and I've sung a lot of songs. I used to take, uh, when I was pastor, and I used to take uh, the songbook, and you know you get discouraged from time to time. And I guarantee you, if you'll take this songbook and start in the very first, and, you know, just sing a verse or the, or the chorus of whatever ver uh, song it is that you know, and you just begin to work your way through the songs, uh, by the time you get just a little ways in there, you're going to be a little bit encouraged. Your spirit is going to be lifted up. But uh, sometimes we sing songs we really don't mean. I mean, I'm guilty of it. You're guilty of it. We sing these songs about Jesus. Uh, we make commitments to Jesus. Uh, you know, I think about uh, a song that was written some, I don't know, some uh, it's, a, uh, it's more of a, uh, it's a contemporary song, but it has a lot of meaning. You know, and part of it says, how many times have I knelt before God and asked Him for mercy for things that I've done? We, we go over and over and over again, and, uh, which is, you know, thank God that we can do that. Thank God that we can go every day if we need to and ask God to forgive us of our sins uh, but a lot of times we just, we say words, we sing songs, we make commitments that we don't really mean. We're not going to follow through on them. We pray prayers that we doubt sometimes in our heart. Now, I'm guilty of this, and I know that you are. Uh, we pray prayers, asking, we know God can heal, uh, but we'll pray and ask God to heal somebody. But in our hearts, we really don't think he's going to do it. And so we forget who he is. We forget what he's done, and we forget... Uh, that he is our Lord, our Savior, our King. Uh, but he deserves our praise. I mean, we should praise him every day. And there are several scriptures, and I've, I've said this many times, uh, just about without fail every day. Now, this very seldom. Sometimes it depends. But most every day before I go to work, before I go into the building to work, I always pray and I always read certain scriptures. Uh, and I read the certain scriptures every day for a reason, because of what they mean to me, uh, and because it's a prayer asking God uh, to be with me, to be real to me that day, to make me a blessing to others. Uh, and, but if you, you know, and so some of these uh, Psalms, one of them is Psalms uh, 144. Uh, and it talks about, blessed be the Lord, my strength. And then it goes through, as you follow through that, Blessed be the Lord, my high tower. Blessed be the Lord, my uh, refuge. Blessed be the Lord, my deliverer. And it goes on and on and on about blessing the Lord. It's just praising the Lord for who He is and what He wants to be to me uh, and to you. 
Another one that I read quite often is Psalms 145. Uh, it is a psalm that Jake DeAndre preached from years ago, and I still remember it very well. And it talks about, he, was, he, he says, I will extol thee. And that word extol, uh, here's how I remembered it. Uh, Jake DeAndre took off his watch, and he says, extol means this. It means to be lifted up. And so we lift him up. We praise him. And I do that, uh, you know, before I go into uh, the workplace there, and I'm dealing with people. Uh, if you've ever been in Walmart, you deal with people. And some of them are not too good to deal with. Are, is that right, Sandra? I mean, they'll try you. And if it were possible, you could lose your salvation. You'd lose it there. <laughs> I guarantee you. So, you know, he deserves our praise. Our lives should praise him uh, because of what he's done. Uh, for us. He saved us, forgive us our sins, given us eternal life. Uh, I mean, just think about that. Words of praise, praise are meaningless unless our lives back them up. So our praise uh, should be something in our lives. They praised him, but they didn't mean it. A third thing, quickly, they knelt as if they worshiped him, but it was all in form. Notice also in verse, 19, uh, verse 29, they bowed the knee before him. I mean, they knelt before the King of kings, the Lord of glory. They knelt before the creator of this universe, and they made like they were, they just mocked worshiping him. Uh, you know, and they, I think about, you know, how deeply it must have grieved the heart of Jesus when he was seeing all this, when he was watching all this. The creator as he was treated as a criminal. Uh, the savior that was worshipped outwardly but inwardly was rejected. Uh, the son of God falsely accused, falsely worshipped. Uh, they were going through the motions but in their hearts they were mocking him. They hit him as we read these scriptures. They spat on him. Uh, they wounded him. Their worship was meaningless. And sometimes I'm afraid that, you know, we do just that. Uh, we go through the motions of worship, but do we really truly worship the Lord? Uh, sometimes it does you good, to, and you've got, and I believe it was Andrew Mary that said in his book, you've got to practice putting yourself before the Lord. It's something that you've got to practice. It's something you've got to put uh, into play, and we do that by faith. And so as we set ourselves before the Lord, sometimes it does us good just to sit before the Lord and don't say anything. Just think about who He is. Think about what He's done. Uh, and think about our relationship to Him. We know that there's a lot of theatrics, uh, you know, in church services and uh, around, the, around the world, but not very much real biblical theology to back it up. Uh, worship today is based on feelings and not on, not on facts and faith. Uh, I've witnessed the people many times, and they always talking about feelings, but it's always facts, uh, faith, and feelings in that order. Our faith is based upon the facts of the Word of God, and if feelings come, thank God. Uh, but if they don't, you, it's just by faith. And sometimes that's what it is. Uh, we go through the motions, but there's really really no reality to it. In the Old Testament, God gave the people of Israel many rituals, many things to prepare them to worship God, to serve God. Uh, at, but over a period of time, they became indifferent. Over the period of time, they became uh, hardened or just indifferent to what was going on. They were going through the motions. They were doing the rituals. And this was especially true by the time Jesus Christ came. Uh, the people there, the, uh, there in the uh, synagogues and roundabout. But uh, over a period of time, they lost touch with God. We, you can, the church is one of the easiest places to lose Christ. It is one of the easiest places to become, uh, you know, un, you know, be, to, be, to lose touch with the Lord Jesus uh, in our lives. And like the children of Israel. Uh, sometimes they were, they were going through the motions of it to appease him and not to please him. I think we're guilty of that. 
Let me just give you two things. The challenge that's before us is to give the Lord His rightful place as King in our lives. That's where He, that's where he wants to be. That's His rightful place. That's where He should be in the life of the believer. He should be King. That means He's in charge. That means He rules uh, and reigns in our lives. That means we uh, are just the subjects. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't have any... Uh, it's not us steering our lives, as it were, but it's supposed to be Him. Uh, we're to give Him His rightful place as King. We are to praise Him from our hearts and not just from our lips. It should be something that... And everybody's not a shouter. Uh, I, I mean, I, I've always sat in a church, and I had, uh, I had an aunt. She'd be sitting back here, and all of a sudden she'd just start, Woo! Scare me to death. And uh, we'd have people that shout and jump around. Uh, Willie Peel, I don't know if any of you ever knew Willie Peel. He was, uh, he was another shouter, he and his wife. Uh, we, ha- we were come up in that, me and Joan, but it, I, it didn't affect me that way. I didn't shout. I didn't holler. I didn't run. I didn't jump. I didn't walk the pews. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of quiet by nature. Uh, but... Uh, you know, we're to praise Him from our hearts. And there's different ways of doing that. And you can do that uh, without making a big fuss. But he, we're to praise Him from our hearts, not just from our lips. We are to worship Him in spirit and truth. What does that mean? It took me a while as a young Christian to figure that out. This truth, of course, is talking about reference to the truth of the Scriptures. Jesus says, he that believeth in me as the scriptures hath said. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with what mom and dad said. I, I remember asking a young girl one time, uh, they wanted her to be baptized. She wasn't about seven or eight years old. And I asked her, uh, and uh, we became real good friends. I mean, she, uh, she, this girl, Heather, uh, was her name. She died when she was about, what, 36 uh, with breast cancer, had just a three-month-old baby. Uh, and it was so sad, but this girl had a tremendous testimony. But when I first encountered Heather, she was about six or seven years old. Uh, her mom and dad wanted her to be baptized, and I asked her one day, I said, Heather, I said, how do you know you're saved? And she says, my mama says I am. It is, you know, Jesus says, he that believeth on me as the scripture hath said. Uh, and so... Uh, it, it's, worship, it's worshiping Him upon the truth of the Scriptures. And, of course, in spirit is, is faith. That's the only way you can worship Him, in spirit and truth. Uh, I, it might have been a little bit uh, scattered. I only had a couple hours to get ready. But think about this. They crowned Jesus, but they didn't make Him king. They worshiped Jesus, but they didn't mean Him. They praised him, but it was all, you know, just in pretense. It was all just mockery. I hope that we're not guilty of all of that or any of that, but sometimes I believe that we are. Jesus, uh, we're living in the church age where he's on the outside of the church wanting in. We have the Spirit of God in this place this morning. How do I know that? Because I'm here. And if you're saved, you brought him with you. But there's something about there's something that's lacking. I don't know. There's just no real power in the church. And it all has to do with our relationship and what kind of, uh, you know, relationship we have to our king. Is he king? Uh, are we really worshiping him? Are we really praising him? Let's stand. Uh, as uh, Dennis and him comes, uh, we're just going to have a stanza. I don't know if the Lord has spoke to your heart or not. I hope so. Uh, but uh, make him king in your life today. Uh, make him your king and serve him as his servant, his subject. Would you come? Anybody have a need? If you're lost and you need Jesus as Savior, we'd want you to come.
prayed for the pastor, and 